Well, thank you, Veli and Lubomira and uh, Abe and Caitlin and all the organizers. I hope you can hear me now. Um, and thank you for everybody who's uh, listening and watching. This is a presentation about epistemic injustice in chronic fatigue syndrome, stroke, myalgic encephalomyopathy. Uh, that's a long name, so I frequently abbreviate it to CFS, stroke ME or CFS or ME, as many other people do. I'm Hugh Robertson Ritchie. I'm a, I've been a general medical practitioner in England for a, a long time, and I'm now also a PhD student in the University of Kent. Uh, this presentation is about the bitter disputes concerning CF. SME and how it should be treated and in this presentation I try to be neutral and I try to concentrate on analysing the issues. I start with the testimony of Alice Hattrick about some difficult consultations with doctors. Uh, Alice is um, a young woman who has suffered the symptoms of CFS ME for many years and is not improving. Uh, when our knowledge of our experiences and our sensations are dismissed when we don't know if we have made something up or if it really happened, because we are supposed to question that live reality, to believe it in my own, to believe it to be fiction, unevidenced and illegitimate, I know it in my own body. And uh, Alice uses the words knowledge and know. Uh, so clearly this is, there's an epistemic issue here. Uh, what, um, what, uh, uh, is described is uh, typical of the many testimonies that are available on the internet from CFS ME patients about their unsatisfactory experiences with healthcare professionals. The themes are that patients feel they're not believed when they describe the severity of their symptoms uh, or how the symptoms affect them or how they interpret their symptoms and this, these disputes cause harm and stress to the patients. It, it, the aim of this presentation is to show some of the disputes regarding knowledge about CFS ME and uh, just trying to, try to get my screen a bit easier for me to read. Uh, and these disputes are not just agential between uh, individual patients and their healthcare professionals, but also systemic and uh, and structural between patient support groups on one side and medical professionals on the other. Now I'm trying to get to the next, next, uh, Click on the slide. next slide. Click on the slide itself. Uh, to question some of these knowledge assumptions and to question some of these knowledge. So the outline of this presentation is what is CFS? ME and okay. the biomedical model, we talk about that, then, the, then we talk about the biopsychosocial model, and then we take a short look at what epistemic injustice can tell us, and then another short look at what the concepts of standpoint theory can help. And then I ask, should there be limitations to epistemic privilege, and are there possible compromises? So what is chronic fatigue syndrome, etc.? some of the symptoms, reduced energy for physical, emotional or mental exertion, post-exertional malaise, concentration and memory problems, which patients call brain fog, uh, abdominal symptoms, sleep problems, and other symptoms, muscle and joint pains, headaches, frequent infections, palpitations, and many others. Patients usually say the most disabling symptom is post-exertional malaise, PEM, because after any exertion, physical, psychological, or emotional, they feel knocked out uh, and uh, a lot worse for some time afterwards. Uh, and these symptoms are long-term and they disable people. So what do we know about CFSME? Uh, not enough is it's poorly understood, unknown cause, the mechanisms for the disease processes are not established, nor do we understand how the, any disease process would give the particular symptoms they have. There are no laboratory tests that help us decide who has this condition and who doesn't to demarcate it from other 
conditions with similar symptoms. And worst of all, there's no curative treatment. Because of the lack of tests, the diagnosis is made purely on symptoms. There are a number of diagnostic definitions using symptoms, but I don't discuss them here. To sum up, it's a mysterious condition. So how do ME people understand what's going wrong? Um, the biomedical model of disease and illness, BMM. Symptoms arise from an underlying abnormality in the body and mental processes and behavior are not the cause of the illness or the disease and treatment of the condition doesn't depend on addressing mental processes or addressing behavior. So the biomedical approach and understanding works brilliantly in some diseases, for instance, uh, in type one diabetes, where insulin is life-saving or pneumonia, where antibiotics are life-saving. Uh, the patient's cognition and the patient's behavior don't really take a large part in the curative process because uh, of course in first part of the disease, they may actually be unconscious. So they still get better if they've got the right treatment. So the biomedical model in ME is applied in this way, that there is yet to be a discovered physical factor in, that causes all the symptoms and the discovery of this factor will lead to a cure. And so according to the biomedical model, the symptoms of ME should be addressed in this way. Act as if you only have a limited amount of energy. You have an energy envelope and uh, if you've exceeded that, you're going to have to rest. Exercise only with limits from your own experience. Follow any exercise by deliberate rest and deliberate rest is itself therapeutic and deliberate rest can be also preemptive. If you've got more, a big task tomorrow, you should rest more today. And uh, ME support organizations fund only research into using biomedical model. For instance, this is ME Research UK. The primary aim is to fund biomedical research to find its cause, develop effective treatments, and ultimately find a cure. Uh, the interpretation of ME patients is that they have a biomedical condition without any psychological or behavioral aspects in its causation. But unfortunately, biomedical research so far has failed to find a cause or a mechanism or, and biomedical research has failed to find a cure. That doesn't mean there won't be success sometime in the future. But in the meantime, we have to do something else. And many healthcare workers respond to this situation by advocating the application of the biopsychosocial model of illness and disease, BPS. According to the biopsychosocial model, which is applied to many conditions nowadays, the body isn't a machine as envisaged by the biomedical model and that mental and behavioral issues are relevant to many conditions. For instance, in heart failure, chronic lung disease or arthritis, where there are conditions where the underlying body abnormalities are understood, we do have the knowledge. The patients are encouraged by their therapists to, ex to not to accept symptoms as like shortness of breath or pain as limitations, but to exert themselves, push the envelope, and after a time, an exertion program like this enables many patients to do more. But the use of the biopsychosocial model in these conditions is not controversial, unlike in ME. Uh, the, the, according to the CFS, uh, the, the biomedical, sorry, according to the biopsychosocial model, CSF is a problem of patients' behavior and cognition. Patients with CFS tend to avoid physical activity because in their view, activity causes symptoms of fatigue and myalgia, muscle pains, and this avoidance behavior itself leads to more symptoms through physical deconditioning. So this de physical deconditioning is something that patients are advised to do something about. Um, they need to rest less and exercise more according to BPS model. Uh, we need to accept, 
accept that the BPS conceptualization is very much an outsider's view, is not, it doesn't use the patient's knowledge or interpretation of their own conditions. According to BPS, there are two recommended therapies, talking therapies like CBT and exercise therapy. The talking therapy, CBT, helps you manage your problems by changing the way you think and behave. And it's based on the concept that your thoughts, feelings, sensations, and actions are in interconnected. That is the BPS model. And negative thoughts and feelings can trap you in a vicious cycle of doing less, feeling worse, doing less, feeling worse. But ME patients object to this treatment as it is designed to be designed to change the way they think and behave. In addition, they, they find that talking therapies don't work. And because CBT is a psychological treatment, patients assume that their condition is being classified as a psychological condition. They claim that being thought of as having a psychological condition is stigmatizing and that psychological symptoms are thought of as being less real than physical symptoms. The other treatment is exercise therapy. This is graded exercise therapy or recently renamed as personalized paced exercises, exercise programs. Uh, but these involve in incremental increase in exercise, for instance, say 5% per week. Uh, but patients say that these exercise therapies make their symptoms worse and it goes against their understanding that rest is beneficial. There are therefore bitter disputes. Uh, recently, Get GET was rejected by NICE, which is the British National Organ Institute for Healthcare and Excellence, which is the official organization that gives advice to British healthcare professionals. And they, they made this decision last year uh, after um, participation of patient organizations. But agreement within the committee wasn't possible and some of the doctors on the committee that made this recommendation uh, resigned before the report came out. Uh, but despite this rejection by NICE, uh, exercise therapy is still supported by many of the health authorities in Britain, including the Royal College of Physicians and the Royal College of General Practitioners. Uh, these uh, talking therapies and exercise therapies are not popular with people with CSF ME. For instance, this is Hannah Turner's comment, graded exercise therapy, it is known in the ME community as you'll get better if you stop being so lazy. Uh, and cognitive behavior therapy, a psychological treatment that continues to tout the belief that ME is all in our heads. There's something going wrong here. There seems to be evidence of injustice because these patients claim to have knowledge, but many healthcare professionals reject that knowledge and go against it in their treatment recommendations. So how can we understand what's going on? In section four, I give a brief account of epistemic injustice. Uh, according to Miranda Fricker, uh, epistemic injustice are forms of injustice are wrong done to somebody specifically in their capacity as a knower. Uh, as we have seen, ME patients uh, have knowledge of their own case and the, and the medical professional has any second-hand knowledge, but the medical professional imposes the treatment according to her own interpretation. Uh, epistemic injustice has two strands. Testimonial injustice, when prejudice causes a hearer to give a deflated level to, uh, to give a, uh, to a speaker's word uh, because of their status. And uh, this happens in ME because of their status as patients rather than medical professionals. Uh, hermeneutical injustice, also is relevant, is wrong, wrong done to somebody by denying their understanding or the making sense of their experiences. And ME patients say they are disbelieved when they try to describe how they interpret their illness experiences. And these hermeneutical injustices, of course, are not just individual, but 
uh, and agential, but also structural and systemic. So we do have evidence of hermeneutical injustice. Uh, so can standpoint of theory help? Again, I give a very short uh, abbrevi abbreviated uh, account of hermeneutic of a standpoint theory, see if it can help us decide what we need to do about this situation. According to standpoint theory, groups who lack social privilege can be the sites of epistemic privilege. So the advice here is to give more epistemic weight to those who are underprivileged in the, in the interactions between patients and healthcare professionals. Uh, and there's benefits to all. If patients' testimony is to be believed, their interpretation is accepted as being as valid as healthcare professionals' interpretation. Uh, and CS, if any patients' agents who should be paid attention to, they are suffering testimonial hermeneutical injustice and their accounts should be given epistemic privilege. So section six, then we, we move back a bit should we ask, should there be limits to this epistemic privilege? Should the, is CSF ME a distinct disease? The existence as a, as a distinct disease hasn't been established, although the insistence of ME patients is frequently that it has been. Uh, there's no curative or biomedical treatments, and so that uh, if we were to, if they were to exist, we would apply them. If they don't exist, we can't apply them. We have to do something else. Uh, there may be subgroups requiring different treatments. The um, exercise therapies and talking therapies have failed in many patients with ME, but they have success in some, and so there may be subgroups that we haven't managed to discover yet, uh, and maybe these treatments should be given only to those, offered only to be those who are likely to benefit. Um, and uh, graded exercise therapy and CBT help in many other conditions, so why shouldn't it help in ME? Other, bio, other problems associated with the biomedical model in ME. The CSF ME patients seem to be forming to, uh, to a bit supporting a localized form of dualism, that physical symptoms are a different category from psychological symptoms, and psychological conditions are a different category from physical conditions. This dualistic approach is not supported by most healthcare professionals who can appreciate the importance of physical symptoms in, say, depression and the psychological effects of a major event like a heart attack, and that treatment for both these conditions, depression and a heart attack require an understanding of the biological, psychological, and social aspects of a patient's condition. Bern claims that the epistemic problems in ME between patients and doctors may be merely a reflection of the doctor's understanding that there is epistemic uncertainty regarding ME. There's conceptual impoverishment. Uh, and uh, uh, she also claims that the epistemic problems <laughs> may be um, injustice towards doctors if they are uh, acknowledging that there are knowledge problems related to ME and not ignoring them. Um, De Boer writes of formal healthcare, uh, writes about formal healthcare policy making in the Netherlands where ill people and patients are also engaged in deliberations, which is similar to the NICE deliberations. And uh, uh, she appreciates the value of patient representations, representatives to describe their experience of the condition, but has less regard for patients' insistence that ME is a somatic condition, not a psychogenic condition, because that limits further inquiry into behavior and emotions. Possible compromises. Acknowledge that agential and systemic injustices are occurring, so that's the responsibility of individual 
healthcare professionals and the health care organizations like the Royal Colleges in Britain. Um, and these, uh, we need to all acknowledge our present ignorance about ME, uh, including the patient uh, support organizations. Uh, we need to continue biomedical research and perhaps get government funding for that because at the moment, most of the funding comes from voluntary donations. Um, as far as treatment is concerned, we need to use post-exertional malaise as a placeholder, as something that really exists and really causes major problems for ME patients. Um, uh, but we should appreciate the value of psychological help and exercise in this condition and others. And that needs, a, again, a compromise between patients and their healthcare professionals and also between patient organizations and their health care uh, and their own uh, health organizations. Uh, and uh, we should continue psychological and behavioral researches. So thank you very much. That's the end of my presentation. And here is my list of references and bibliography. Thank you very much. Sound of real clapping. Thank you so much here for, for the great talk, for making it so timeless. Um, so if we can just um, unshare your screen and then brilliant. Um, uh, and then we'll take questions, one from the 